Hi everyone, I hope you're all well and healthy. Thank you for joining us for the second talk of our golden week of webinars and astrophysics series. My name is Evelyn Johnston. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Astrophysics at the Pontifica Universidad Católica de Chile. And together with Thomas Putzia, a member of our faculty and the head of outreach, we have organized this week of webinars. We are excited to bring you talks from scientists who have significantly contributed to the fields of astronomy, astrophysics and cosmology, and thereby expanded our understanding of the nature and the inner workings of the universe. It will hopefully be an exciting and instructive journey for you, as well as for us, as we move from the largest scales of the universe, over structure and galaxy formation, to the formation of planets and the fabric of reality itself. We're looking forward to bringing you these talks in the original English with simultaneous Spanish translation to your screens without any registration fees. This has been made possible by the generous support of the Vice Rectorate for the investigation of the Pontifica Universidad Católica and also the Centre for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA for its Spanish, Spanish acronym. Our second talk this week will be given by Volker Springel of the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Germany, uh, but we'll first give you a brief introduction as to how the seminar will run. We're looking forward to bringing you these talks in two languages. For this, we have arranged for a simultaneous language interpretation provided by Mr. Patricio Gonzalez, director of Serendipia Soluciones, who will be simultaneously translating for us in both English to Spanish and Spanish to English directions. On your devices, you can switch between English and the Spanish channels using the language button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Unfortunately, during yesterday's talk, we discovered that the live interpretation option is not offered for people using Zoom in the browser or on Linux machines. We apologize for this. We will post both the English and Spanish versions of the talks on the Astrophysica USA YouTube channel very soon in the future. We also heard from a few participants that they could not mute the original soundtrack when listening to the Spanish translation. This appears to be a bug in Zoom and we've been told that by leaving and rejoining the webinar should be fixing the issue. If you have any questions during the talk, please type them in the Q&A window. To open the Q&A window, please click the Q&A button also at the bottom of the Zoom page. All viewers will be able to upvote or downvote questions and comment on them. We have a team of astronomers and journalists behind the scenes who will be monitoring your questions and select the best for discussion after the talk. The talk is expected to last 45 minutes and we will have plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. The questions for audiences will be selected only from the Q&A window, so please do not type them in the chat window. Before we begin, I would also like to briefly introduce the other members of the panel who are with us today. So we have Thomas and myself and Patricio Gonzalez, who is acting as our interpreter. From the faculty at the Institute of Astrophysics, we have Gaspar Galaz, Franz Bauer, and Ezekiel Triester. And we also have Giuseppe Dago, one of our postdocs, and Cristobal Moya, Simon Angel, and Ernesto Camacho, who are uh, graduate students at the Institute. It's also our pleasure to welcome Mike boylan Colchin, uh, who's from the University of Texas in Austin, and Julio Navarro from the University of Victoria. And finally, we have Dian Daniela Fernandez, Carola, uh, pardon, Carol Rojas, and Ricardo Acevedo, who will be managing the Q&A uh, during this talk. So finally, it's our pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Volker Springel um, as our second speaker this week. So Volker carried out his PhD at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, completing it in 2000. He then carried out postdocs at the Harvard Center for Astrophysics and the Computational Cosmology Center at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics, where he became the group leader in 2005. In 2010, he was appointed professor for theoretical astrophysics at Heidelberg University and became the research group leader at the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies, or HITS. As of 2018, he is the director of the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Garching in Germany. Volker's research interests include cosmic structure formation, dark matter, dark energy, galaxy formation, feedback processes, supermassive black holes, and of course, high performance computing. During his distinguished career, he has received many awards, including the Klung Wilhelmi Weberbank Prize for Physics in 2009, the Hoover Prize in Cosmology in 2020, together with Lars Hernquist in recognition of their work in cosmological simulations in which they develop methods that test existing theories of and inspire new investigations into the formation of structures at every scale from stars to galaxies and to the universe itself. 
And now we would like to hand over to Volker to tell us about his work on hydrodynamical simulations of galaxy formation. Volker. Yeah, <clears throat> welcome uh, to all the people listening to this talk. Let me first say this is a, a great honor for me to be invited to give this seminar. I hope you can understand me well and, and see my slides. Um, I will also show a few movies. Um, those will probably not come across with the full quality, but uh, I'll give you pointers where you can later uh, look at them on the web if you want uh, with high quality. So this uh, morning, this afternoon, I would like to discuss um, hydrodynamical simulations of galaxy formation. This is a field concerned with the nonlinear problem of cosmic structure formation. And I will try to motivate uh, why I think this is very important nowadays from a, to understand galaxy formation from a theoretical point of view. I'll try to introduce the methodology a little bit and the, and the physical background of these calculations and, and give you a flavor of uh, what the current state of the field here is and, and also what are the current challenges uh, for future calculations in this area. Um, I assume that Jim Peebles yesterday uh, talked already a lot about uh, our standard model of cosmology. Um, one of the, the key observational treasure chests we have today, of course, are observations of the microwave background that you see here uh, on the right in this uh, temperature fluctuation map and also the polarization signal has been observed with Planck. And on the left two diagrams here in the top panel, you see the, uh, the temperature temperature fluctuation angular power spectrum. And the measurements here are the, the red uh, dots, which uh, are extremely well fitted by a min so-called minimal six parameter lambda CDM standard cosmological model. And you see that the quality of this fit uh, to this data is amazing. Um, this is also true here in the bottom for the uh, polarization uh, temperature cross correlation. And uh, this is sort of one of the uh, large, uh, you know, important con confirmations that we have that the initial conditions left behind by the hot Big Bang some 13 and a half billion years ago, which are essentially directly observed here, are very well described by a, a very simple uh, model, the Lambda CDM cosmological model. And you know, with these direct observations, we have now a very good understanding of where the universe came from. Uh, 13 and a half billion years ago, it was a very simple simple system and uh, the uh, matter and uh, the radiation was almost uh, uniformly distributed. There were only these tiny ripples in the, in the matter density fluid at the time. And we think that these ripples that are seen in the micro background gave rise to all the structures we have in today's universe, including complex galaxies like our own Milky Way, uh, which you see here depicted in this cartoon. And now the problem in a way is uh, how do we bridge these 13 and a half billion years of cosmic evolution from the simple initial state to the complex systems we see today. And you know that the earth is uh, just a typical, you know, planet, not one of the most common ones, but you know, a planet around a typical star in a, in a relatively minor spiral arm in a rather typical spiral galaxy. But the questions that are still to be answered in cosmology is you know, why you know, are galaxies of a certain size, why do they have certain shapes? And um, that's what uh, computational cosmology tries to do, is to compute this link from the uh, simple Big Bang cosmology, uh, from the simple initial state of the universe to the complex evolved one today. And, you know, how do we do this? I mean, you essentially have an initial value problem. Uh, the standard model of cosmology ties down the initial conditions uh, that gave rise to structures um, unambiguously. Uh, so all we have to do is, in principle, to evolve this initial state forward in time. And this is a problem that's largely in the realm of classical physics. For example, for the helium-hydrogen gas, we have the Navier-Stokes equations that are shown here. This is a hyperbolic system of conservation, conservation laws that uh, you know, are complicated, but uh, could be integrated forward in time. Uh, and then you could link the initial state with the complex state today. Of course, the baryons are not the only constituent in the universe. We also have uh, dark matter. Um, dark matter, the uh, you know, unidentified elementary particle that we think the dark, the dark matter is, is made of, is governed by something called the collisionist Boltzmann equation, which you see here in this uh, red box in the top, this just describes the conservation of phase space locally. 
because these particles are supposed to be inert uh, under, you know, do not interact anymore today, except uh, feel the gravitational force and the gravitational field itself is described by this Poisson equation, which is an integral partial differential equation because you have to, first of all, integrate here on the right-hand side over the distribution function of the dark matter to get the density that gives you the gravitational potential by a Poisson's equation, which feeds back here into this part of Lasso system. And you're then ending up with a very complex, complex partial differential equation that is in fact so difficult already that you can only solve this with pencil and paper in very few cases that are highly specialized. And there are, of course, this other physics like radiative transfer, magnetohydrodynamics, or certain effects of general relativity, which become very important near black holes. Um, and it's of course well known that GR is a, is a complicated theory with uh, extremely complicated highly nonlinear partial differential equations. So these can be solved analytically except for a few select cases. And what's however different uh, in recent decades is that we have very powerful machines, supercomputers and number crunching systems that we can task with the work um, that's needed to solve these equations. And that's uh, very much the program of computational cosmology, trying to essentially discretize these equations, uh, take the initial state of cosmology, and then integrate forward in time and see what comes out of that. And um, this is very much what has determined much of my past research, uh, is exactly trying to do these type of computations. And even you know, having these powerful machines, the problem is actually very hard. And you know that the composition of the universe today, according to the planck lambda CD model, is, is a, a very strange one. In fact, we think that you know, the energy density today is made up uh, by about almost three quarters dark energy, which is particularly mysterious, a uh, kind of an anti-gravitational force becoming important at late times in the universe. A quarter is matter, but most of that matter is, uh, is this luminous dark matter. Um, and then we have ordinary matter, which is helium hydrogen gas in, in the beginning, um, which requires the fluid dynamic equations. And <clears throat> often in the past, the, the problem has been simplified by pretending that uh, the ordinary matter is also dark matter. Then you arrive at a so-called fiducial dark matter only universe. And the dark matter only simulations were uh, absolutely instrumental to verify that this whole idea Lambda CDM actually makes any sense that this uh, strange dark universe gives rise to structures in the matter distribution that uh, look, you know, promising enough to be pursued uh, further in terms of galaxy formation. And here is a is a first, you know, result of such type of dark matter only simulations. Um, this is from the Millennium simulation from you know, 15 years ago, and it shows you what's known now as the, the cosmic web, um, the large scale matter distribution on scales of several hundred megaparsec. And it's made up of these filamentary patterns. Um, um, and at the intersections, you have large halos. This is, for example, in the center, a big galaxy cluster containing of the order of a thousand galaxies or so. And you see that the matter that was initially uniform is, is distributed very, very differently today. Um, it is highly structured, is highly uh, clustered, as we say, and in the centers of these structures, the density is about 10 million times the background density. And in the large scale regions that are uh, largely empty now, it maybe has dropped to 10% or less of the initial density. So it's far, uh, far away from the initial simple state, it's far in the nonlinear state. And the calculations uh, on supercomputers were necessary to establish this picture and also understand the internal structure of these objects. In fact, nowadays, I think these dark matter only simulations, they are so mature that they are reliably predicting the abundance of these nonlinear objects as a function of their mass and um, as a function of time. They predict the spatial distribution, the internal structure um, of these objects, uh, meaning, for example, density profile, other properties like spin shapes, etc. So, and, you know, in a way, this problem is really very well understood. The different numerical codes that exist, they also agree on the answer. So we do really understand 
very well what uh, cool dark matter is doing and what the nonlinear outcome of the gravitationally sharpened initial conditions of the lambda cdm cosmology are. And this has also been used, for example, to decorate the large scale pattern of matter distribution, of the matter distribution with, with galaxies. This is an, an old uh, result um, um, of the Millennium simulation where the large scale distribution of observed galaxies, which you see in this blue pie diagrams, famous galaxy redshift surveys that mapped out the logical structure of the universe. Here's the CFA two great wall or the Sloan great wall on top, which is a very prominent large structure, or the 2DF galaxy redshift survey on the left. That if you go to the, these dark matter simulations and you decorate the halos with physical models for how galaxies might form, these are somewhat uncertain, but the, the large scale clustering pattern is, is relatively robust uh, in these models. Then you find patterns that are very similar to how the galaxies are really distributed in space. And I think this was a, a very important initial success um, of these embodied simulations that they are able to explain the cosmic logical structuring, uh, logical structure in the galaxy distribution very well. Of course, nowadays, these types of effects are, are now still very much used to uh, study the logical matter distribution in, in ex exquisite detail with upcoming so-called dark energy surveys that try to use this clustering signal to, for example, map out the expansion history of the universe to very high precision. So the dark matter only simulation in that respect are a big success story. In fact, we can nowadays simulate, you know, all the structures that exist in the dark matter down to the smallest halos we expect in typical uh, WIMP scenarios for the cold dark matter particle. So this is from a recent work by Jay Wang and co-workers where uh, uh, a sequence of zoom calculation was used into the cosmic logical structure, zooming into ever smaller dark matter halos down to the bottom lower right where you have uh, mass resolutions in, in the simulation of 10 to the minus 11 solar masses allowing you to resolve halos of about 10 to the minus 6 solar masses. So about Earth mass with hundreds of thousands of particles. And so that allows one to uh, study basically all dark matter structures that exist in these scenarios and uh, also then check, you know, how at this thermal um, cutoff scale, maybe the you know, structures of these objects uh, change, which are otherwise relatively self-similar. So just to summarize this, so dark matter structures are, are fairly well understood. But you know, this is of course uh, not the real universe. Um, we would like to account um, for the full problem somehow in the simulation sector as well. And that means we can't pretend any longer that the ordinary matter uh, is also behaving like dark matter. We need to address it phase on. And that means we not only have to deal with the uh, smooth gases uh, by means of fluid dynamics, but then, you know, under gravity, these gases we know collapse to make stars. That's the interesting thing, of course, we observe in astronomy but also more exotic objects like supermassive black holes. And um, so the addressing the full problem of galaxy formation will require to treat the physics leading to stars and maybe even the physics uh, related to supermassive black holes as well. Um, and that's very difficult, uh, but people have, have tried and I, I, but for a long time, uh, these efforts have met substantial difficulty. Here is uh, an early pioneering calculation from a body at all uh, from 2003. And here you see a, a so-called zoom calculation. This was a hydrodynamical cosmological simulation that not only simulated the dark matter, but also helium hydrogen gas and had uh, prescriptions for radiative cooling of the gas and then also for the settling um, or for the um, conversion of cold gas into stars. And what you then see here is actually a uh, a galaxy, these are the star particles of a forming galaxy at different redshift. If you look today at the uh, matter structure of this, this galaxy that is formed here, you find that it has a very unusual rotation curve that's shown here on the left. Uh, the rotation velocity is a function of radius and the rotation velocity shoots up here to something like 400 to 500 kilometers a second in the center and then falls to something of the order. Uh, 250 or so, uh, but um, it is not 
you know, a flat rotation curve like we would expect for a big disk galaxy like the Milky Way, where the, that should look more something, you know, should be fairly flat and maybe at a value of about 200 kilometers a second and not show this enormous mass concentration in the center. The reason this galaxy here in this simulation behaves that way is because it contains an extremely massive bulge in the center. Um, so there is a sphere, and this bulge is the spheroid. This is the dashed line. And uh, we basically made a galaxy here on the computer. Our body did this uh, and co workers, um, which is dominated by a massive central bulge. And the disk component, which is the dashed line here, you see is totally subdominant. In fact, you only see this here on this diagram because the disk particles were you know, plotted on top of the spheroidal particles. But in terms of mass, they are subdominant. And so this galaxy is not anything like a real disk galaxy that we see today. And it suffered from a, a, a problem that has become known as the overcooling catastrophe. These hydrodynamical simulation of galaxy formation generically um, ended up producing way too many stars. Uh, by factors of several with respect to the stellar content real galaxies have. So star formation has been then realized as a, as a process that is surprisingly inefficient in the real universe. And here are other examples that demonstrate this. Here is a, a very early result from my own work with Lars Hertz, 2003. This shows the cosmic star formation rate density as a function of epoch in a very low resolution cosmological hydrodynamic simulation. And this is, you know, data points from the, from the time and shows the usual peak of uh, cosmic star formation activity at around redshift two or so. And today it has dropped by a factor of 10. This is something what the simulation sort of reproduces, but you see the amplitude of this simulation result lies a factor of three or so higher than where it should be. And if you would repeat a calculation of the same physics using the modern calculation abilities, which allow much higher resolution, this blue line would be lying much higher still. So, you know, star formation is simply way too efficient. Here on the right is another uh, attempt to simulate uh, cosmological volume, um, the whole galaxy distribution basically, and uh, the luminosity function of uh, galaxies, how it's observed, is shown here with these symbols. And this has the shape of a so called Schechter function. Uh, more or less a power law here, which is relatively flat. And then towards massive galaxies, there's a very sharp exponential cutoff that basically says that there is sort of a maximum size of galaxies and bigger galaxies become very quickly exceedingly rare. And the simulation calculations and different, you know, the simulation predictions are these colored lines. And, you know, you see that they really don't quite look like the observations at all. First of all, on the faint end here, the, there has, is a steeply rising abundance of small galaxies, very differently from what's observed. Then on the massive end, you have way too many massive galaxies, big beasts that are simply not existing in the real universe. And here right at the knee where the Milky Way would sort of lie, also the shape doesn't look right at all. I mean, you basically, this is a pretty terrible prediction for uh, what's, what's compared to what's observed. So this, you know, is from 2009 and the basic, this is sort of 10 years ago. And this was the state of the field back then. No, uh, no match of the predictions for, for, for hydrodynamic galaxy formation with observations at all. But the situation over the last decade has really markedly changed and it progressively became better and better, I would say. You are some uh, results now from about eight, nine years ago from Cecilia Stiania Peko with the Aquila project made some first disk, but you see they are still somewhat blurry, relatively thick. But then quickly in this Aries calculation, the Oscar Argot, the, the galaxies that were simulated, they looked more like uh, real spiral galaxies. Um, then with the years, you know, here's a result by, by Stinson, Alma, Marinacci, Phil Hopkins see that the galaxies become nicer. And if you here on the right, look at uh, all the images that are made from the simulation, they, they start to look more realistic. And if you look at today's possibilities, this is um, a result uh, that we uh, produced last year from uh, work by um, Federico Marinacci and co-workers. 
you see that this simulated galaxy, uh, here's a face on view and here on the right and an edge on view, starts to look awfully like real simulated, uh, like real observed, uh, uh, you know, grand design spiral galaxies. You have young stars, they are blue in the spiral arms, you have uh, dust lanes. Uh, and, you know, in general, if, if you looked at this from a distance, you might not be able, able to even recognize uh, that this is a, a, an artificial calculation and not a, a real observed system. So at this point, you probably ask yourself, okay, great, these look nice, but wh what on earth has changed? Why did the theory become better? And the fundamental reason for this is that the that the overcooling catastrophe, that the, the basically the runaway process of star formation has been curtailed in modern calculations by so-called feedback physics. Um, this is, these are, is more or less a summary token term for physics that um, slows down star formation galaxies, um, reduces the total mass of stars, and then allows them um, to eject some of the excess you know, cold gas to, to reduce uh, the stellar mass to the observed levels. Uh, and, you know, that there are processes that, uh, you know, counteract the, the relentless pull of gravity is, is relatively clear because we, we know, of course, that stars evolve, they, they die occasionally um, as supernovae and then locally inject a lot of energy. So traditionally, uh, these supernova explosions are the prime suspect. Uh, as the source of energy that is uh, heating up the gas again and then uh, slows down star formation. But uh, this was also the, uh, you know, historically the, the first attempt uh, by people to account for this source of energy in a, in a simplified way. Um, but there are also other processes that have been invoked in recent years, uh, like the mechanical output uh, of stellar winds, because, you know, Massive stars actually release a lot of energy that way. Active galactic nuclei, uh, we understand now that supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies are uh, important probably for galaxy evolution, at least for massive galaxies. And these accreting black holes release a lot of energy that might couple to the star formation process, slow it down. Uh, but then also more complicated physics uh, like radiation pressure on dust, or uh, other effects like photoionization are important. Certainly um, the, these uh, UV radiation fields, they can change the ionization balance of, of, um, of uh, atoms and, and simple molecules and then thereby change also the radiative properties. You have processes like photoelectric heating. You have uh, non-thermal particle populations, so-called cosmic rays. Those provide, for example, in the Milky Way, a lot of the pressure. I come back to this later. Also to magnetic fields, you have magnetohydrodynamics uh, in the interstellar medium, uh, potentially uh, playing a role. And also more exotic physics has been invoked to all to essentially slow down uh, the process of star formation. And you see that this shopping list of physics is, is uh, adding uh, an incredible complexity to uh, the, the problem of understanding galaxy formation. So it's in no way simple, uh, if, especially since all of these uh, processes can interact with each other in, in sometimes highly nonlinear ways. So it's, um, that's also what you know, still keeps the field very occupied, trying to understand which of these processes is actually important and critical and which other ones are uh, maybe happening and are interesting, but are not are one of the key players. So um, besides this um, complex physics problems, um, there are also, and that has uh, also been responsible for some of the progress, uh, important steps made in the accuracy of the simulation methods themselves, because those are actually also uh, important. Uh, not all of them are always uh, sufficiently accurate. You have the, the problem of limited resolution. You also have other more subtle effects. You, here's an example that tries to illustrate this. Um, on, the, on the right, you see the outcome of um, the same initial conditions simulated with two different numerical methods. One is a, a moving mesh code, which I'll come to in a, in a second, that uh, 
um, I actually out of, uh, developed out of frustration with some inaccuracies of this other code on the bottom, which is a so-called smooth portable hydrodynamics method uh, here done with the, with the gadget code. And what you see is, is actually the gas distribution. Here's the temperature field on the left. Um, Actually, no, it's on the right, I think, the temperature field and the density field on the left, or vice versa. I, I, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> it's a long time ago. But uh, what you basically see is the gas uh, in both cases. And, and uh, for the same initial condition, so in principle, this says, and for the same physics, that the result should be the same. But you see that the disk galaxy that's formed here looks somewhat different. I mean, the good news is there is a disk galaxy in both cases. But this one on top is better defined uh, is, uh, is uh, larger and in the uh, circumgalactic medium, which is the gas around this, this galaxy, you see it's smoother, right? You know, it has broken up into lumps here at the bottom. So there are real differences in the numerical methods and the pundits in the field, they fight a lot about, you know, which method is now better than another one. Um, and there are fundamental uh, fights also about, you know, is that even important given that this physics that I just alluded to is creating even bigger differences than these numerical inaccuracies that some of the methods have. But I, I would argue that uh, both is important. Uh, one needs to, uh, if one has a choice, one obviously needs to use this, the most accurate numerical method available to reduce the inaccuracies and in, uh, coming in uh, from that, because otherwise you are, you are at the risk of, of, you know, hiding that with some, uh, physics that you that you blame um, to cause a certain effect but in reality it's just your inaccurate simulation code so here uh, if you can uh, view this movie this is an illustration of this method of the moving mesh that we developed specifically for the problem of of galaxy formation um, here the uh, fluid which is initially the smooth gas is discretized on uh, not by by particles but on a on a mesh like it's traditionally done in so-called Eulerian Cartesian hydrodynamics methods, where there's a huge literature on that. The, the novel thing here is that we use the dynamic mesh, as you see here, and this is a Voronoi tessellation um, of cells created around a set of mesh gener generating points. You see some of them here. Um, and you see that uh, these markers, the red points, so they generate uh, basically a cell around them. Uh, it's the region of space that's closer to these points than to any other of the mesh generating points. And this direct differentially rotating disk is sheared apart, but the mesh doesn't uh, get destroyed. And this allows um, now that the mesh sort of continuously flows along with the gas. And it's, you know, when the gas flows into a galaxy, the mesh contracts as well, and the resolution automatically becomes higher at the centers of galaxies where you want highest resolution. And then the code computes numerical fluxes over the boundaries of these cells, taking all the motion of the cells into account. And that allows one to arrive at a method that is Galilean invariant at a manifest level. And that is very useful because it allows you to study supersonic flows with high accuracy, basically flows that move through space with a, with a speed that's much larger than the sound speed of the gas. And that's actually happening in galaxy formation all the time. And this particular method is, is very well suitable for this. So let me now, um, with this plenary remarks, come to a bit to the sort of current state of the art, what the simulations are capable of. And in recent years, several groups have published uh, large cosmological hydro simulations like illustrious Horizon Age in Magneticum, Eagle, Massive Black and, and also TNG. And I'll talk now uh, most of my, the work I was involved myself, namely illustrious and illustrious TNG. So the illustrious simulation from 2014 was the first one that used this moving mesh method. And it um, had a very nice first result because we managed to, for the first time, reproduce the morphological mix of galaxies. So the simulation basically produced elliptical systems, which you see here, and also disk galaxies over here. Some of the disk galaxies also had, uh, had big bars. And then with these stems, you can create something like a Hubble sequence, a Hubble, Hubble's tuning fork diagram basically was reproduced from this calculation. And also the morphological mix of galaxies, which 
actually varies systematically with stellar mass. This variation was reproduced too, meaning that the more massive galaxies, they were preferentially large spheroidal and elliptical systems. So there is a transition from low, low mass galaxies, which are most in disks, to elliptical galaxies at the right place. So this was the first big success. And the physics that ent was uh, you know, entering in the simulation, just to uh, summarize it very briefly, consists of three basic blocks. You need to model besides gravity, of course, this is uh, uh, clear that this needs to be included, self-gravity and the dark matter. And then in the baryonic sector, you have a radiative cooling and stellar evolutionary processes related to enrichment. Um, because metal enrichment modifies the radiative cooling processes. And then once the gas becomes dense, you have to have some prescription for star formation and the feedback processes related to star formation, meaning stellar winds and supernova explosions. The details of how this is modeled is, is, are complicated. I, I skip over this, but let me mention that we also need to model uh, supermassive black holes. Uh, and I'll come back to this now uh, in more detail in a second. And um, so these are the three big blocks in illustrious. And for the next generation illustrious simulations, we modified that in a number of ways. We added magnetic fields and we changed the modeling of the black holes and their feedback process quite a bit. And I'll, I'll explain uh, later why we've done that. And for illustrious TNG, this is the next generation illustrious simulation project. This is uh, just to show you who is done. This was a small team of these 11 people uh, from uh, basically a German US collaboration uh, working for a couple of years on these calculations. And we have done three simulations uh, here now, TNG 100, 350, and the names basically refer to the roughly the, the box sizes uh, that were simulated here. These were periodic universes as it's commonly done, um, periodic boxes, and we've interleaved basically uh, these uh, three calculations such that we have uh, a, a broader range of scales covered. Uh, you need the very large volume to study uh, especially large scale clustering uh, and rare objects like which galaxy clusters but uh, that goes, uh, you know, once you have a large volume, uh, you're limited to a certain number of resolution elements, and then you need to uh, compromise on resolution. And the opposite end, the TNG50 simulation is a small box of 50 megaparsec, has roughly the same number of resolution elements, and then you have a much higher resolution there, but you lack uh, a good sampling of the massive end. But combined, these simulations then are a powerful way to cover a larger range of scales. And um, we made these uh, data of these uh, hydrodynamical simulations publicly available and um, already um, some more than a year ago and uh, for TNG 100 and 300 will soon for TNG 50. And I think this has been a, a very gratifying success because it turned out that this is very useful for many purposes, not only for what we came up with ourselves and, and so far more than 130 papers have already been written on these simulations and for the older illustrious it's even more than 200. So this is a, also an illustration of how, how useful these methods are now for theoretical cosmology and for comparing to observational data. This is the computer we used for this, Hazel Hen. It was a supercomputer, a Cray machine in, in Stuttgart, uh, 7.4 petaflop peak performance. By now this has been actually dismantled and replaced by a new supercomputer named Hawk. So these machines are very expensive and unfortunately they, they age quickly. So after three to five years, you're basically bound to invest uh, a lot of money into the next generation. But it's very good for, for us researchers, of course, because we then um, are benefiting from this race towards ever larger uh, high performance computers. Now I'm showing here a short movie, a movie of some of the time evolution. So I'm I'm, I, I think you will very likely uh, see only a, a, a somewhat choppy version of that, um, but hopefully a few frames come through. You see here the gas distribution in the background. Um, you see how turbulent this is. This is a proto-galaxy assembling. Uh, on the top right, you see a redshift counter. It's about redshift three now. The bottom left, you see uh, in this inset, the dark matter distribution, and on the bottom right, uh, uh, the stars. Um, and also the gas in a different rendering. 
And at this early time, you see that uh, the system was relatively spheroidal, the bulge of this, this galaxy has formed. But now we already make out um, a quite decent um, rotationally supported disk system that has formed here. This is a cutout from one uh, of our simulations, um, TNG50 on the left, you see uh, in this uh, intermediate stopped frame, you see the metal distribution. So the stellar winds um, um, and the other feedback process, the, they expelled a lot of the heavy elements produced uh, by the stars so that we now have ended up with a fairly enriched circumgalactic medium. And you know, in the bottom right, uh, clearly uh, a spiral galaxy has now formed. And from redshift one to zero for five, six billion years, you know, this makes many rotations and largely passively evolves and grows a bit further. And this is very much how we imagine that a system like the Milky Way has formed over time. But we not only have one of these pseudo Milky Ways in the simulation box, but hundreds to thousands of them. So it's possible then to study the diversity among the formation path of uh, galaxies like the Milky Way. If you're interested in movies like this or, or other ones uh, in higher quality, please look at the TNG website. You find a whole selection there. Let me very briefly try to uh, convince you that these calculations have a lot to do with uh, the real universe because they make actually predictions that are surprisingly good matches to a lot of key data we have. Here in this diagram, you see, for example, the color distribution of galaxies in different bins of stellar mass. And these histograms show data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is an extremely accurate accounting of, you know, essentially the present day's universe. And the bimodal color distribution is reproduced by the illustrious TNG model very well. And the, the, you know, the, the transition uh, to the red sequence that you have at the massive end happens also at the right place. This was a very important success. The galaxies are also at the right places. You infer this by looking at the clustering signal. This is again the SDSS uh, data, which are the black points. These have exquisitely small error bars and the, you know, the TNG predictions, they, for at least for the, the key stellar mass spins, they more or less go through the data. The, the agreement is not perfect to see here, but it's, it is uh, surprisingly good, certainly better than we had expected initially, especially if you look uh, at this also, uh, you know, subdivided uh, according to color. This is now the clustering signal for red and blue galaxies. Uh, again, the Sloan compared to the TNG model, and uh, you see that the red galaxy and the blue galaxy cluster roughly in the way they should. So this is um, an indirect confirmation also for the Lambda CDM cosmology that it really can give rise to patterns in the red and blue galaxy distribution that have a lot to do with observations. And the, you know, the internal properties of galaxies are also uh, agreeing fairly well. These are galaxy sizes. Uh, they match for the late type and early type galaxies, what we observe. And also uh, more subtle things, for example, morphological distributions in a multi, uh, dimensional plane. Here's a nice paper by uh, Rodriguez Gomez who looked at um, uh, in pan stars at, at morphological indicators like the Gini coefficient as a function of M20 and other concentration measures. Um, um, and you know, so here you see the distribution of the pan star systems. And if you take the simulated galaxies, you make artificial light images out of them and then observe basically simulation the same way you process the observational images in pen stars, you end up with distributions that are awfully similar. So this is also uh, showing successes that were ne not necessarily expected. But you know, there are also important discrepancies, but they are relatively subtle. For example, if you look here in the same comparison at uh, the bulge sizes as a function of stellar mass and simultaneously at the galaxy color, then you find that there is in the observation some correlation between the morphology and the galaxy color, but this is not as strong in the illustrious TNG model. We think this has to do with uh, actually supermassive black holes that are in our simulations responsible for establishing the red sequence. And whatever triggers this uh, activity of the black hole can't be quite right because we're missing this correlation between morphology and galaxy color. 
these simulations are also important for uh, you know making predictions for how, for example, the Milky Way should look like, um, how much dark matter uh, we are expecting, say, at the solar circle. Uh, and if you look at modern mass reconstructions from observations, for example, for the ma mass models by John Bowie, for the Milky Way, you see that uh, they differ from simulation predictions in, in quite an important way in the sense that the simulations predict much more dark matter in the inner parts of galaxies than you uh, infer from some of these uh, kinematic analysis. So that's something that is, uh, um, has always uh, occupied uh, theoreticians and observers, whether the Lambda CDM predictions for you know, the internal structure of dark matter halos are fully consistent with uh, the structure of observed galaxies or not. This is occupying us to this very day. Other predictions, let me skip this for the diffuse gas. And also this uh, is the uh, more for the cosmologist. Uh, the impact of the burning processes from AGN are also felt on relatively large scales as this comparison of the matter power spectrum, the full matter distribution to the one for dark matter only simulation shows there are 20 to 40% effects on large cosmological scales. And those are actually going to be very important in the future uh, when we want to harvest the power of surveys like LSST uh, and Euclid that are upcoming um, that will that aim primarily to constrain dark energy, but these are important systematics that the, un, you know, the uh, hydrodynamic processes are maybe uh, spoiling the show a little bit uh, and make this, this much harder to exploit the data on moderately nonlinear scales. Let me now ramble a bit on the black hole feedback itself, because that's um, something that is, I think, uh, remarkable that this was largely driven, I think, uh, in part by uh, simulation experiments that the, the suggestion that black holes, supermassive black holes play a very important role in galaxy evolution and are not just an interesting bystander sort of in the galaxy evolutionary uh, process. And, you know, this is a cartoon here that shows sort of the, in, you know, uh, scientific process in astronomy a bit. We, we have astronomical observations, we analyze our data and condense it to a theory and the theory leads to hypotheses that will, they will be checked with new astronomical observations. Uh, and simulation methods, they have become, come in as an additional tool in, in, the, uh, in the tool set, both of the uh, experimental astronomer in a sense, because you can use them to carry out numerical experiments. But at the same time, numerical models are also part of theory. So they are now an important part of the theory building itself and simulations are here very important. And you know, one area where you might want to make such experiments are maybe in the context of supermassive black holes and what they do to the galaxy formation process. If you um, think about what a typical quasar releases in energy, you find it's really a lot because you know, they can shine uh, you know, with the luminosities or up to 10 to the 12 solar luminosities for time scales of say uh, 10 to the seven to 100 million years or so. And over that course, they would then release 10 to the 60 to 10 to the 61 arcs of energy. So this is a billion supernovae right there, right? So a billion supernovae explosions um, ought to do something you would think to the galaxy. But you know, whether this is really true, it's, you know, it's not necessarily totally evident uh, because the radiation could also just leave, right? You somehow still need to couple it to the galaxy. But you know, the, um, in general, um, the overall energy we expect from black holes is comparable to what we expect from stellar evolution. We know this because uh, in galaxies, we observe supermassive black holes with give or take a mass of about a thousandth of the stellar mass. And when they grow by gas accretion, uh, we expect that about 10% of the accreted rest mass energy in the black holes will be liberated as energy. And for the stars, you get 10 to the 51 Ergs per supernova for an, and about one supernova per every hundred solar masses in stars. And this gives you sort of the energy density of supernovae uh, feedback accumulatively over the course of the history of the universe. And if you take the ratio of these two numbers, you find out that you know, the black hole energy uh, uh, released is of the same order as the supernova energy. So that shows that there's probably an important player. Um, and so 2005, I, I set out with Tiziana Di Matteo and Loss to make a numerical experiment because we, we made a very simple model and tried to understand, you know, 
maybe this energy does something to, for example, colliding galaxies. And so we put in a very simple model of an accreting supermassive black hole into these galaxies that you will see colliding here on the right. And we said, let's make the most simple uh, minded idea that they grow by Gondi accretion. And then uh, we limit this for the adding accretion rate. And then 10% uh, of the accreted rest mass energy is liberated as energy. And let's assume that 5% of this is not just escaping, but heating the, the, the local gas. And this was one of the most stunning numeric experiments in, that I ever done because I didn't really know what to really expect. And I, I ran the simulation and it sort of, this is what happened that these black holes, there were two of them in the simulations, they, they kept accreting. And when the galaxy first passed each other, there was a little bit of an accretion effect. And then when they merged and the black holes coalesced and the, the gas was piled up on top of them, they grew exponentially up to a point where so much energy was released that the gas was thrown out. Uh, and the, the galaxy was then left uh, red gas poor and became red very quickly. And we thought at this point, oh, wow, this is really great. This is a way to make red in dead galaxies, right? It's via quasar feedback. But the, the, the story of, of quasar feedback can't be the full story because, uh, and there's little direct observation evidence for this. What we have evidence for is that in galaxy clusters, the supermassive black holes, they create these ripples and, and hot bubbles uh, inside clusters and jets and that's that's seen in clusters and so we actually did uh, then some what later create another feedback model for this bubble feedback so Deborah Shiachki who's now in Cambridge did this and that's what we implemented in the in the luster simulation that that is now running here and uh, or at least parts of it um, let's see whether I can accelerate no, I can't um, no, this is not really working um, now, yeah, here you, you might see that the dark matter evolves and now we blend over to the baryons and um, there are these explosions in the centers of some of these galaxies. This was uh, the radio bubble feedback, um, so-called radio, radio mode feedback in, of supermassive black holes in galaxy groups and clusters. And you see that this was very violent in the luster simulation. And if you look at this movie, uh, you see that it, you know, you know, you will easily be convinced that maybe this is too violent because um, apparently a lot of the gas leaves out of these uh, groups. In fact, this this indeed happened. Here um, we we you know created too low gas fractions in, in the in the uh, poor galaxy clusters, and despite that, the central galaxies were still forming too many stars. They weren't fully they weren't red enough. So, and that means it also wouldn't help if you made this process still stronger, uh, you could not fix it. And that's why we turned for Lester Steen Jichu to different uh, physics. So we went back to the drawing board and thought about, you know, um, based on observational motivations for how do supermassive black holes really keep red galaxies red. And from these observations of the red, so-called red gazer galaxies, we then developed a new theoretical models for a maintenance mode of, of black hole feedback, which we called kinetic radio mode feedback. And I don't have the time to go through the details, just suffice to say that this is the key reason why the Illustris TNG model behaves differently and why it was so much more successful than Illustris. In particular, it creates the correct barium fraction in these systems. Um, let me make one comment, I'm, I'm soon coming to the end, but about resolution limitations. Um, this is maybe the most contentious issue when it comes to cosmological simulation because there's always, and that really uh, is very important to me to hammer this home, that there's of course always a resolution limitation um, because we cannot possibly include, for example, the formation of planets, of course, or their, their climate and atmosphere in the cosmological simulation. So there is a scale that you can simulate. And a lot of these scales are unfortunately very important for what you simulate. For example, a thermonuclear flame front in an exploding supernova maybe has, you know, is sub centimeter thick. I mean, this scale is evidently never included directly in a cosmic simulation. Even in a normal supernova explosion simulation, this will be extremely difficult. So you have, however, to treat the supernova explosion somehow. And that is what's called the subgrid scale. And it gives rise to many, um, many discussions 
And I think what's really important is to acknowledge that there's always a range of scales that cannot be simulated directly in these type of simulations. And um, only as also, only a subset of the valent physics can be included and one has to be you know, open to these limitations, but they are not a defect because we do this always in physics. We represent, we represent unresolved scales by approximate models and exactly this is what we're doing in the simulations. Let me show you an example of this. Here is an interstellar medium of a simulated disk galaxy. This is a modern calculation where you see a multi-phase interstellar medium and bubbles. They come from the supernova explosions happening here. Here you see a side on you of this. So this is a state of the art multi-phase interstellar medium calculation. This is the same galaxy with a calculation or method that's 15 years old which is the Springer and Hernquist subgrid, explicit subgrid ISM model. And you see that this looks very different. The ISM is now artificially smooth. You see this especially when you look at the sideways, there's still some spiral arms, but there's no sign of a multi-phase interstellar medium. Nevertheless, despite this subgrid approximation, the star formation rate you predict here is the same in both of these calculations. So it depends very much on what question you ask whether one of these simplified treatments is sufficient or not, it will not be sufficient to you know, study interstellar medium, but might be sufficient to study the total stellar mass in the galaxy. And um, this is uh, something to keep in mind. And the other thing that saves you is that you have emergent phenomena, complex behavior that arises even from very simplified treatments. This is an example from Glenn Nelson's recent work where he shows that the simplified spherical symmetric kinetic uh, radio mode feedback we have around our black holes in fact gives rise to highly uh, bisymmetric outflows from these galaxies and that is some a, an emergent phenomenon that is basically made possible by the conservation laws themselves similar you know another phenomenon is like shock capturing we are not simulating the real thickness of shocks but the con conservation laws guarantee us that we end up nevertheless with the correct post-shock state in the gas. Uh, magnetic fields, this is another novel thing. Just uh, very rapidly, we are able to predict uh, magnetic fields now, how they arise in spiral galaxies. This is possible with TNG. The magnetic profiles radially of these disk systems, they match observations fairly well. We think this comes about from a small scale amplification of the magnetic field or starting already early on. If you look at the turbulent power spectra, we see this uh, small scale dynamo uh, in action and it amplifies on a, on a time scale of just a few hundred million years, uh, tiny primordial magnetic fields, wherever they come from, to micro Gauss scale, at which point these dynamos saturate and then the amplification stops. And with this, we are able to then, you know, make predictions for how the magnetic field looks like, typical spiral galaxies. You can compare that to observations of further rotation measures. And generally speaking, the statistical comparison you can make here, here for example, case 2F51, is, is encouraging. So the magnetic fields, they, they, are, in, they are plausible. They, they do seem to agree with the currently available observations, which is uh, certainly not an, something that is naively expected. And you know, the magnetic fields, they, they don't slow the star formation down very much for us, but they, they have other effects. For example, in the circumgalactic gas, which you see here around a massive halo, uh, the uh, neutral gas distribution are the lumps here in this region. And they are cold. And it turns out they are actually held up uh, in part by magnetic pressure. They're magnetically dominated. So that one would expect that maybe without magnetic fields, the predictions uh, for the circumgalactic medium would, would be potentially somewhat different. This is something that Dylan Nelson has investigated. And um, finally, um, if I may, just a few words on cosmic rays. I mentioned this in the beginning. Uh, cosmic rays are uh, providing a third of the pressure in the interstellar medium in the Milky Way. Simulating them directly is in, you know, very much impossible because you know, the gyro orbit of a GeV cosmic ray proton which would be responsible for most of this pressure. This is sort of like, you know, has a size of the solar system. And it's 10 to the minus six parsec. Uh, galaxy radius is 10 to the four parsec. So this is 10 to the 10 times smaller than the galaxy itself. This is impossible uh, for the foreseeable future to simulate directly. And that's why one needs to develop for this type of problem, 
effective two fluid theories that can be treated with hydrogen acids. So many groups are working on this uh, recently because it uh, seems that uh, the cosmic rays might be responsible for driving galactic winds and outflows. That's something we have studied with this sort of system of equations with our simulations. Um, these are you know, horribly complicated. Again, a motivation why you need supercomputers to study the nonlinear coupling of the cosmic ray fluid to the ordinary gas. And if you do this, you find that uh, the cosmic rays drive uh, from the interstellar medium uh, strong outflows under certain conditions. This is shown in this uh, work by uh, Christine Simpson, which compares basically so-called stratified box simulations, uh, little pieces from a disk that you see inside on here. And if you have no cosmic rays uh, on the left or, uh, or cosmic rays that are locked into the fluid here, you get just this bubbly ISM, but with the cosmic ray uh, included and, and also an isotropic diffusion process to get these strong winds uh, blown out of the galaxy. And we think that cosmic rays potentially hold the secret for understanding actually the physics that really drives, drives baryons out of uh, galaxies. And this very much needs to be done. Otherwise, we can't understand um, why, you know, especially small halos, uh, small galaxies contain so few baryons, uh, a lot less typically than we expect from the cosmic baryon mix. So in cosmic ray physics is an respons responsible, uh, is, a, is a particular promising player here. And uh, these are other studies where we looked at this effect as a function of halo mass and you find then out the mass loading of these winds and the energy loading uh, is flat. These are exactly, so it's strongly rising towards small systems. These are exactly the properties that are invoked in the cosmological treatments by hand basically to get the luminosity function shape correct and cosmic rays kind of naturally have this correct scaling. That's another motivation why a lot of people work on this. On the other hand, I should say in recent works, you know, it's clear that uh, if that's true, then you know, we have to, again going back to the drawing board because if you just add cosmic rays, for example, to a simulation like TNG, you're not getting the same nice galaxies back out again, but they are slightly different. They are, for example, perhaps smaller. Uh, perhaps the bulges are stronger or the bars uh, and that may maybe that means you then have to uh, dial down the efficiency of your supernova feedback to get back the same galaxy sizes this is something that we're currently working on and you know to do this i should say this is my final slide i promise um, we need to um, improve our tools further the tools for the computational cosmologists are actually the codes that you put onto the supercomputer and i like to uh, make this analogy to an instrument that you're building and to put on a, on a huge telescope. Without a powerful instrument, the telescope is relatively useless. And it's the same, of course, with a supercomputer. If you don't uh, develop a powerful code, then um, the machine is also very limited. And the, the current generation of cosmological codes, unfortunately, are very big. They are now complex beasts. So a repo uh, that was used for the Lustus TNG simulation has 380,000 lines and it's developed by many people. We have uh, published a, a public version of that uh, last year. So you can download the code and play with it yourself and you'll find out it's, it's actually a horrible uh, mess of things. It's very difficult to understand if you're new to it. Uh, and it's the, you know, it's the accumulative effort of many people over many years. So and unfortunately, this complexity is becoming a huge challenge for the future because uh, we probably can't continue anymore in the mode we've done in the past that single people develop these codes. And, and Gadget 4, which we are working on currently, is also pretty big already, even though it's a much simpler code. So we're planning to release this soon. So I'm at the end, uh, um, I probably have overrun in time. I'm sorry for that. Here are my take home points. Um, I want to give you a brief tour on uh, the recent hydrogen cosmological simulation progress that has made, been made for Lambda CDM. These simulations uh, are quite successful, but they rely on, of course, well, a modeling of still uncertain physics, in particular black hole accretion and its feedback processes. Uh, they make interesting predictions for magnetic field amplification via small scale dynamo. Um, but we think that they are incomplete in various ways, despite all their successes. For example, cosmic rays, and I've unfortunately raised to that, are, are still missing. 
Um, also direct treatments of radiation fields uh, were missing, um, among other things. So uh, there's still much to be done for the future. Uh, and these future simulations, they will have to address uh, a very difficult multi-scale multi-physics problem, which exactly is what galaxy formation is all about. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Volker, for a wonderful talk. Um, we have many questions in the Q&A, and I'm sure there are many questions also in the panel. Um, I would like to start with one question that was really highly voted in the Q&A section by um, Guillermo Blanc. And he is asking you, um, could you comment on the possibility of simultaneously solving for the cosmological expansion and structure formation instead of fixing the cosmology throughout the simulation? And what impact does that structure formation have on the evolution of the cosmic expansion and I guess the global uh, cosmological parameters in the evolution? Okay, so the uh, so maybe I should clarify that of course the, the cosmological expansion is simulated as well here. So we are using a, a Friedman model where the space expands constantly and uh, the structure formation process is treated basically as a perturbation around a homo homo homogeneously expanding background universe. And um, that is the uh, meaning that uh, we have a co-moving piece of the universe that is getting bigger and bigger in, in physical scale as the simulation progresses. And also the dark energy in, in this case as a cosmological constant is included. Uh, that means there is an accelerated expansion. But this comes about, of course, by our uh, input, but because we assume that the cosmological parameters have a certain value. Now, I'm not 100% sure whether the question asks whether we, we shouldn't uh, maybe you know, do it more accurately, for example, apply general relativity directly, locally, so that uh, maybe the local expansion rate could be modulated by the local density that you have in a larger piece of space. And that it could be maybe even a back reaction of structure formation on the expansion rate. These are questions that have been discussed in the literature with uh, fully, only in recent years successfully, with fully relativistic structure formation simulations, not with baryons, but with dark matter alone. And it turns out that basically the differences that you're getting between a, a correct simulation of general relativity uh, with you know, um, solving for the metric everywhere, not just uh, as a perturbation around the Friedman equation, the deviations to this treatment we are doing here are very, very small. Uh, for most clustering, it's at the 10 to the minus 6 level. So we think that this um, mathematical approximation of GR is, is relatively okay, at least for lambda CDM. There are, of course, uh, we also do simulations of other cosmologies, like, for example, other theories of gravity, even f of r gravity, for example, mostly in order to understand whether how, how they would look like. Could you tell them easily apart? Uh, and could, you know, what, you know, how easily can you, you know, tell different gravitational laws from structure formation? So we're also doing them, but not uh, at the level of detail that you see here in Elastis TNG. Okay, thank you very much. Before we move on with other Q&A questions, I would like to open to the panel the questions. And I see that Franz has a question. Okay, very nice talk. Um, so, I mean, I guess, how important would you say supermassive black hole feedback is? If you, if you take it out, you, you basically can't reproduce uh, many of the, the galaxy parameters. And if that's the case, are there any key observables that you can predict from the simulations that we could actually test with future observations? Um, mostly yeah. because, you know, as you said, uh, the smoking gun for um, this sort of form of feedback has been difficult to find um, and locked down. And so it would be great if, if the simulations could somehow tell us, that, you know, you need to look here. Um, this is where and what to kind of expect um, so that we could kind of focus some observational energy on on that. Um, so so your, your insight in this would be great. Um, yeah, no, indeed, the, the predictions um, 
are the ones that, that would be most useful if, if, um, if we can predict um, an impact of supermassive black hole feedback, um, coming up with an effect that it is, it has so far been unknown and, and then observers would, would look for it and maybe find it and then it would confirm such a model. Um, so there are a few things. For example, we found that um, if you look at correlations um, between black hole mass and, and for example, we find a correlation between the, the, the black hole mass as, uh, and the disk scale length, for example, you know, in, in the sense that uh, negative correlation, so the bigger the black hole is, the smaller the scale length of the disk galaxy is. So this is something, you know, we interpret as, as uh, happening probably because the, if the black hole grows bigger, it it's, heats the gas more and then it, it can't cool down to make such a big disk, right? So then the disk is going to be smaller. So if you now, find uh, observationally, for example, that there is an anti-correlation between the black hole growth and the disk scale length, then that would be consistent with one of our models. Or it would be uh, not you know, proving it, of course, but it would be uh, um, encouraging. Um, other, you know, in galaxy clusters, so it, for us, the black hole feedback uh, really renders, especially large galaxies, uh, uh, their properties are, are strongly dependent on the black holes. and uh, in the clusters, uh, for example, the, the metallicity profile and the degree of turbulence in galaxy clusters um, in the gas there um, and how mixed the metals are, how the radial profiles run in metallicity is sensitive uh, to the black hole feedback model. So, for example, upcoming X-ray observations that better you know, constrain that um, in galaxy clusters, they will be directly informative too and could be compared to our observations. Um, the other, um, you know, evidence for, for quasar-driven black hole feedback that, you know, galaxy collisions, there it's a mixed bag. There, there are observation studies, for example, that found, uh, they look at closed galaxy pairs and there you would maybe expect that those should also show signs of AGN activity and some studies found, found signs for that, others didn't. And um, so there's, there's more a mixed bag. But I th my impression is from the observation literature that uh, there uh, is more and more evidence that at various places also for AGN feedback playing an important role. Okay, we have other questions from panel members, uh, Ernesto. Okay, hi, thank you for your talk. And I have two short questions. Uh, the first one being, can you comment uh, on the volume limitations of TNG simulations? And what would you think is the path or shortcut to follow in order to simulate cosmic rays and their influence in the galaxy evolution? Um, the, the first question I didn't quite get, could you repeat it? The... Yes, can you comment a bit on the volume limitations of the simulations of TNG? Yeah. So the volume, so despite having simulated uh, 300 megaparsec, uh, basically this is actually uh, still relatively small. We have uh, only sort of one, we, we have a bunch of uh, massive clusters, but too few to study the massive end of the mass function well. And you see also that uh, the baryonic acoustic oscillations, they come in at scales slightly above 100 megaparsec. And you know they are very important um, for cosmology, for studies, or for dark energy, for example. And if you wanted to study the BEOs with illustrious TNG, you are you are unfortunately finding that the volume is too small. Um, and um, this is um, true for you know the upcoming cosmological studies, LSST and Euclid. Um, they require simulations of maybe 50 gigaparsec cubed or so, worth of statistical information. And the direct hydro simulations are very far away from this. That's why we will not be able to produce hydrodynamic simulations of that quality for the volume that you need to compare to Euclid or LSST surveys. So there one needs to re revert back to dark matter only simulations and somehow use those and, and mock up the hydrodynamical effects there. 
for the cosmic rays, um, well, there um, we need a combination of um, small scale simulation or the, the plasma physics community studies, for example, uh, you know, how cosmic rays are produced um, at strong shocks, for example, around supernovae, that's where they are injected for the most part. But then the cosmic rays are spiral, you know, gyrating around the magnetic field lines. That's why it's so important to simulate the magnetic field because the cosmic rays are mobile along the magnetic field lines, but can't move transverse to the magnetic field. So what you basically need to do is to uh, simulate the magnetic field, the cosmic rays, and then the, the so-called transport processes, how the magnetic fields run down a magnetic field line and maybe scatter on alphane waves, uh, which they, by the way, produce themselves through something called a streaming instability, is unfortunately uh, complicated plasma physics. And here we need to reach out to uh, the plasma physics community and talk to them and try to simplify their uh, calculations to the point that we can approximate these processes on the galaxy scale. And we are right at the beginning there. We, at the moment, we, we are doing this by modeling the cosmic ray transport via diffusion processes. But the diffusion constant, you know, there we use the value known in the galaxy empirically. But we have no idea how this value for the diffusivity depends on, you know, other properties. Does it depend on strongly on the, on the gas density, on the magnetic field strength? Etc. That is not very well understood at this point. Maybe a quick point related to this uh, magnetic fields. Since you have the rotation measure calculated and predicted now, um, can you actually uh, calculate or numerically say something about the impact on, on the CMB, the polarization signals, throughout your simulations? Yeah, in, in principle, you could. You could. Um, investigate a lot by basically doing a backwards light cone uh, integration. Um, that's um, what we are preparing for a new generation of simulations where we would like to output directly the data on the backwards light cone to a fiducial observer. And then this calculation will be relatively simple to do and probably interesting predictions are coming out of this. But at the moment, we, we haven't really done this yet. Uh, we could try to piece something together, but it would be an interesting question. Okay, so um, another question from the panel. Who do you know about has a question? Yes, uh, thanks, Thomas, and thanks, uh, Volker, for a wonderful um, talk. I guess I was echoing one of the questions that I saw in the Q&A, and uh, it regards, you know, the sheer complexity of what you described. I mean, although the achievements of basically writing down the equations, discretizing them and applying to a cosmological context has proved uh, tremendously successful. It also, you know, seems to have grinded into higher and higher complexities and uh, the need to, you know, to take into account more and more uh, physical mechanisms. And I, I guess one of the uh, people asking a question was wondering whether this complexity could somehow be alleviated by thinking of the problem in a different ways, like, for example, appealing to AI techniques or machine learning techniques, or I mean, if you want to you know, rethink the whole problem from scratch, are there other methods that are not just basically brute force solving equations in, on a computer, perhaps better suited for at least some part of these uh, problems? Yeah, so I, uh, I'm often asked this question, or it's not, not as, as as uh, precisely as you asked it, but uh, for example, the uh, data, um, the machine learning in particular, but um, data-driven methods that are now, um, of course, in many areas uh, showing a lot of successes, but it doesn't, this wouldn't be a, a way out up to this point. You know, Why do you even bother simulating things? Can't you just use a machine learning tool to predict what the simulation should give? Uh, my answer to this would be, I, I think that th these methods have uh, their value and they are powerful, for example, to, to automatically uh, maybe decorate a large volume. I, I mentioned this earlier that for uh, the dark energy service, we need simulation, we need theory models for the galaxy distribution, which cover a much larger volume than we can directly simulate. So how do you get this? Maybe one approach would be to to learn somehow from a smaller hydro simulation how 
galaxies relate to the dark matter backbone and then use that to create mock catalogs and people are using such techniques already. Um, I still think that uh, machine learning or AI methods are, are not are no replacement for these brute force calculations because I, I fail to see how they add real new understanding or at least it's very difficult to understand what the neural network understands and our goal is to um, to understand the, the physics I identify the main uh, drivers of what shapes a galaxy and I agree this is going to be is very complex and we, we risking certainly uh, you know adding epicycles to a complex problem um, by making it so complicated you can't see through but I think we're not at this stage yet. Uh, we can still uh, fairly, uh, in a re reductionist approach, dissect the problem and uh, understand the role different physics plays. And um, that I think can only be done by uh, a physics-based calculation and not by, by uh, you know, a heuristic uh, machine learning approach. Um, Christopher Moya has a question. So uh, thank you for your talk, it was really nice. And I was wondering, how do you model the growth of the halos? As in, do you model it as if it's constantly accreting dark matter or is there any room for some sort of a dark matter starburst? And you have short uh, episodes that you have accrete a lot of dark matter instead of oh. being steady. Right, so, so the... Um... In these cosmological simulations, one, one of the nice aspects of them is that um, the initial conditions are really determining everything. So we create a realization of lambda CDM. So we're not, after that, we are not needing to model um, somehow when the object grows and don't have to add mass while the simulation is running or something. You, this is, you would have to do this if you had a, an isolated galaxy with a toy simulation, but our galaxy, they're all basically in contact from the, with the universe all the time. They're emerging out of the soup of matter uh, that's there in the beginning and how much mass they create and when is, a, is directly determined by the initial conditions plus gravity basically. So the gravitational forces, uh, the pull of gravity is really determining how these objects grow and here the dark matter is uh, key because it's dominating the gravitating mass. And uh, if you look now at the individual histories of systems, you, you get different types of behaviors. Some galaxies grow their mass in a short period of time and, and relatively rapidly. Others have a, a few um, rapid growth phases. I mean, there's also the issue that uh, we have hierarchical merging. So some systems undergo uh, mergers with other objects, but uh, a lot of the growth is also relatively smooth. So, uh, a typical galaxy like the Milky Way does not necessarily have had, you know, many generations of major mergers, maybe one major merger at some point, but a lot of the mass has actually come in, in tiny, tiny lumps, effectively smooth. And the simulations predict this uh, diversity and uh, on average, the, the growth histories resemble each other quite a bit, but there's still a lot of variation from object to object. <clears throat> Ezekiel had also a question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Volker. And it's kind of a follow-up from Frank's question. So we we suspect and we think that the AGN feedback can be very important, right? And the challenge is that it spans, as you presented very well in your talk, it spans a wide range in the spatial scales, but it also spans a range in time scales, right? We know that the AGN uh, emission can change off by orders of magnitude in something like 10 to the five years. It, it also, in a, in a very clumpy medium, very the, the obscuration in the nuclear region can be very important. So given all these constraints and how important it is for galaxy evolution, what do you think are the next steps in, uh, in simulations to, to more realistically uh, simulate AGN feedback? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So I, I think we need to uh, somehow come up with um, more physically based ways to interleave calculations done on different scales. There are, of course, uh, simulations of, uh, that directly treat the accretion uh, you know, down to the last stable orbit around supermassive black holes, including the you know, creation of jets even with 
GRMHD, general you know, relativistic magneto hydramic calculations that are possible for a certain amount of time directly close into the black hole. And then you can, from these simulations, find out how a jet is formed. The problem is, uh, of course, how do you uh, insert the results of such a simulation correctly into these larger scale calculations? So the interfacing between uh, detailed small scale calculations with these uh, much less detailed large scale calculations that I'm doing, the interfacing that needs to be uh, done better. And for this, we need to uh, invent uh, the correct mathematical treatment of this uh, or numerical treatment. So I imagine that uh, uh, what I call these multi-scale simulation methods that uh, we need to uh, work on exactly this problem. Uh, how can we take the up initial results of say small scale accretion of black holes and uh, marry that with larger scale calculations at a, an appropriate boundary scale. So it's a matter of the correct boundary conditions maybe. So we are currently working on a method, uh, Tiago Costa, a postdoc, postdoc here has done uh, that, a paper come, of his will come out next Friday actually, where he uses a, a, a puncture scheme, basically has a sphere where he uses analytic results for the black hole accretion inside the sphere and then the boundary condition on the sphere, that's what uh, the flux basically of matter that coming, comes out of the small scale, that's what we're injecting in the simulation. And so with this, we're trying to get um, uh, a less ad hoc prescription what happens on small scales, right? And I think that's the way forward. You need to uh, either take analytic models or numerical models that are reliable from small scale calculations and then couple that to larger scale calculations in a less ad hoc way than what we've done so far. Excellent. Giuseppe had a question too. Yes, thank you very much for your clear, interesting talk. And I saw from your slide that uh, mm, most of the time we compare uh, prediction from uh, simulation with uh, the SDSS uh, database, which is, of course, the most complete of low redshift. So I was wondering how much we think we can benefit from, you can anticipate, um, we will benefit from. Um, new subways which are yet to come. We already have Gamma, for example, which goes, um, uh, which is complete at uh, higher redshift, and uh, we will we'll expect, uh, uh, for example, moons or foremost uh, uh, going at uh, very high redshift. So I was wondering how much um, our knowledge could benefit from uh, this uh, new yet to come subways. Well, I, I think. These service will be fantastic. I mean, our knowledge of these early uh, formation of galaxies, where they are, as you know, extremely active. I mean, the galaxy formation process is sort of uh, in its heyday then. Um, so that, you know, just observationally, uh, we, we should not forget our field is, of course, observationally driven. So I, my expectation is that these service will tie down uh, some of the uh, correlations or some of the preliminary results we, all, of course, already know from earlier studies much better. And uh, by comparing our simulation predictions with this, uh, these new data, um, we can verify, first of all, whether our galaxies grow at the right time in the same way. And that will be telling. And um, if, if um, you know, I, I would be surprised if, if this doesn't re uh, reveal new tensions between theory and observations, and then it will be, um, you know, up to the, you know, the theoretical model building, what this means, you know, whether this shows, for example, that potentially, I don't know, maybe, you know, our, the timing of when red galaxies appear in our simulation is, is wrong, potentially, that would then tell, you know, I would interpret this as that, again, the black hole feedback is, is physically not quite correct. Um, so I think it's, it's an iterative process uh, in, the, in the sense that I outlined that uh, these new observations um, test, both test our current models and then, um, you know, disprove them to a certain degree and we need to come up with better models, uh, theory models, and they uh, need to, uh, you know, summarize our improved understanding. So I, I think these surveys will be very important for the type of work I discussed. Um, I think at the moment, you know, the galaxy formation picture that I outlined, um, and uh, Sandy Faber will probably talk about this too um, in the series, um, is, um, is amazing that we have learned so much 
from the data uh, and also the theory models in the last one to two decades about how galaxies form. Um, you know, it seems for me very hard now to imagine that this is completely overthrown in the sense that uh, we suddenly think we don't understand anything, but we'll see. No. <laughs> Mike has a question. Yes, uh, thanks very much for this great overview, Volker. I was wondering, um, since you focused a lot on talking about understanding the details of the physics of a lot of the components of these models, whether you think there is any room for something that's really fundamentally missing in, in some of these models, and this kind of connects to the previous question, or if you think that most of the progress really is going to be made by understanding more um, details of the physics of, of aspects of the models that are already there. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So because I think it basically says, uh, you know, have we, have, we, have we understood the backbone of galaxy formation already? And, and we're now filling in the details. Uh, um, at some level, I, I, I do think um, that's the case. Um, if Lambda CDM as a cosmological theory holds up, of course, you know, as until we are sure that um, dark matter and, and dark energy, uh, you know, are really behaving the way we, we assume in Lambda CDM, but you know, there's a lot of good evidence that says this is not a bad model. And so, you know, even if there's a, 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 a you know, even if we understand it someday that it's not a cosmological constant, but some dark energy, the, the overall impact on galaxy formation might be still relatively minor, right? So, and then I think the missing thing would not be uh, a different dark energy model, for example, the missing thing would indeed be um, more understanding uh, the interplay between uh, the interstellar medium and the accretion process on, on black holes and the radiation and so on. And, and you know, I think there's room uh, for uh, substantial revisions of the model, for example, because we have omitted so many things like radiation fields and so on. And our models seem to be working without explicitly accounting for radiation. And this is almost certainly wrong. So we're basically blaming some effects on the, on, on the wrong actor in a way, right? So and, and, you know, once we um, have a complete physics calculation and, you know, some models are already further than these illustrious TNG calculations, of course, uh, by, for example, accounting for a data transfer, um, then maybe um, we realizing that uh, these models were much poorer than we had thought. So this is, I think, still possible. But I, I don't think that um, in, in Lambda CDM, galaxy formation can be pro can be proceeding very much different. You know, if we maybe have fuzzy dark matter or some other weird model, then um, then there are so fewer dark uh, small st structures that we don't need so strong feedback processes. Maybe that would be uh, the most fundamental revision I could imagine in this picture. It's a little little bit actually that would be my last question. So what what do you think about these? these extensions and alternatives of, you know, this ultra light bosonic scalar field, fuzzy dark matter, warm dark matter in the context of, of all the correlations that we're trying to attack in the models. Well, I, I think these are, I find basis very interesting. So I have a, a student myself who's, who's working on this and, and uh, I, I love it. It's, it's fan, fa fascinating, this uh, quantum wave dark matter. And, of course, the, uh, the problem with the classic dark matter is uh, that the particle physicists are in getting, uh, that's at least my <laughs> interpretation, in increasingly worried and disappointed that the, the, you know, the, uh, what once looked like a natural candidate uh, didn't show up in, in many searches. And so that's why the axions and so on are, are taken more seriously and more exotic models have a, a revival. And until, um, the dark matter nature is really un, unsolved. I think one, one probably needs to at least investigate what would really change. And, and I think for fuzzy dark matter, that is a particular uh, um, strange beast because it's um, going to make behave very similar on large scales as, as uh, cool dark matter does. And so most of the successes of lambda C damage are large, large scales, they would probably survive quite, quite fine, but on on very small scales, where also some of the problems come from, in Lambda CDM, the, the predictions would be very different. So that's why um, I think one needs to seriously look at it, uh, even though I find this even more exotic than, than just the ordinary cold dark matter model, which I had, have completely gotten used to. 
Uh, even so, I think as a newcomer to cosmology, everybody who's not shocked about the idea of cold dark matter and, and dark energy, uh, I mean, yeah, I think everybody needs to be shocked about this initially, but of course, we all, as astrophysicists, we are all gotten so used to it that we take this as totally natural and, and, and you know, at some level, the universe is a strange place. You have to take many things as, as natural. Uh, uh, but fuzzy dark matter is, um, is, is indeed, I mean, Microscopic quantum effects would add, you know, another uh, another icing on the cake, which is uh, pretty interesting. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. Let's see what Stephen Wolfram has to say. About yeah. this. Well, he will certainly have a very different opinion on many of these things. But <laughs> I, I, yeah, that will be very interesting. We should compare afterwards. Yeah. All right. So um, Gaspar has the last question. Gaspar. You need to unmute the mic. Yes, uh, yes, thanks, Thomas. Thanks, uh, Walter, for this uh, nice talk. Very interesting and with many details. I have, uh, I have inspired myself in a question from the public, which is a little bit uh, funny, but it's, it's, it's useful to think. Uh, imagine that you wake up tomorrow and all the technical problems you have in the computers, the parallel computing, the, the memory limitations, everything has disappeared. What would you run uh, to solve immediately because it's very urgent? Oh, <laughs> wonderful on one hand. Um, um, the technical problems, yeah, we do have a lot of limitations, memory and CPU wise, etc. cetera, but um, um, it is actually, we have a lot of, at the moment, for example, we have a lot of computer time and we, we, we still have, of course, problems with, um, running the models that I tried to out, you know, like at the technical level. So the codes, for example, if you add cosmic rays, you know, the codes crash. And so maybe the question is, okay, suppose your, your, your code has no bugs anymore and then, you know, and you can do it. Um, complicated physics. So I, I would probably think, you know, I would like to run a calculation with, which has uh, simulates in a zoom fashion, uh, a milk deformation of the Milky Way with uh, 10 billion stars at least and um, you know actually one star at least one particle per, for all the stars that you know with variable masses and i would then would like to be able to follow the stellar dynamics of all the global star clusters that, that are formed and see how they, they get dissolved and in addition in the gas that domain i would like to be able to follow the radiation field on the fly uh, plus the cosmic rays with correct um, transport processes according to plasma physics. And so in a sense, you know, what I would like to do would be a, a Milky Way system where I have as many stars as sky I can see you know, nearby and, you know, a real, a real match to the real Milky Way. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I just want to finish by saying thank you all for joining us today and thank you very much to Volker um, for taking the time out of his busy schedule to, uh, to give us this fascinating talk and to tell us about his work. Um, so a lot of people have been asking throughout the talk in the Q&A uh, whether the slides will be available, whether the, the talks will be available afterwards. Uh, they have been recorded and they'll all be added to the Astrophysica Use uh, YouTube channel uh, in the coming days with high quality video and with both English and Spanish soundtracks. We'd like to welcome everyone back again tomorrow for the third talk in the series in which Sandy Faber will be telling us about galaxy formation, what is simple and what remains outstanding. Uh, remember you should register in advance for each talk um, and they will be streamed on the YouTube channel as well as on Zoom. Um, so yeah, there's nothing, uh, nothing left to say except thank you all for joining us and see you again tomorrow. Ciao. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.